This is part of a series of talks to document the source of Vedantic influence on America. In the 1940s and 50s, average Americans started to become aware of Eastern religions. Today's subject, Houston Smith, was an early and influential author, lecturer, and TV personality who introduced Vedanta, Buddhism, and Islam to the American public. The early and lasting influence on Houston came, from the, came directly from the Ramakrishna Vedanta movement. Something squealing. Somebody's hearing aid. Okay. Houston Smith used to squeal a lot. His, his wife would say when that happened, Houston, you're singing. We can see evidence of that lasting Vedanta influence uh, in today's yoga studios, the acceptance of the perennial philosophy that all spiritual truths can be found in all religions, and the individual pursuit of spirituality. But the original source of that influence is almost forgotten today. Houston's spiritual teacher, Swami Satprakashananda, predicted this uh, when he was asked, will Vedanta take root in the West? He answered, yes, but the source will not be known. While the Ramakrishna Vivekananda movement can't take all the credit for that influence, it's certainly one of the earliest and most persisting sources. The Ramakrishna order's work in the West originally came through five direct disciples of Ramakrishna who came here to establish centers and teach the truths they learned from their master. Swami Vivekananda was the first, speaking at the 1893 Parliament of Religions in Chicago. The stated purpose of the Parliament was to showcase the various religions of the world as equals with recognition of the universal truth that all paths lead to God. While in America, Swami, Swamiji established the New York and San Francisco centers, he was followed by four other direct disciples, Swamis Saradananda, Turiyananda, Trigunatitananda, and Abedananda. As membership in the Vedanta societies grew, the next generation of Swamis established more centers around the country. Three Swamis in particular attracted the attention of some of the most leading and influential Western authors of the time. Swami Prabhavananda, a disciple of Maharaj Brahmananda, Swami Satprakashananda, also a disciple of Maharaj, and Swami Nikhilananda, a disciple of Holy Mother, Sri Sarda Devi. The authors who studied under these Swamis contributed greatly to the introduction of the Vedanta philosophy to the broader American public. Under Swami Prabhavananda, Aldous Huxley and Christopher Isherwood introduced Vedanta to their readership, most notably Huxley's perennial philosophy and Isherwood's translations with Swami Prabhavananda. While a student of Swami Nikhilananda, J.D. Salinger weaved quotes from Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda into his later works. In particular, the Glass family stories. Mythologist Joseph Campbell greatly helped with the editing of the Nikhilananda translation of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and for a time was president of the New York Center. But today I want to talk about Houston Smith, a student of Swami Satprakashananda. Millions of Americans came to know about Houston Smith through the work of journalist and author Bill Moyers. Hello, I'm Bill Moyers. When it comes to the comparative study of religion, Houston Smith literally wrote the book. The World's Religions, or The Religion of Man as it was once titled, has been a perennial bestseller for decades and a staple of Introduction to Religion courses. I remember reading it when I was a young seminarian almost 50 years ago. Few books have so informed my life in government, publishing, and journalism. Houston Smith opened my mind to the power of religion and cultures the world over and their impact on human events. Widely acclaimed and popular, Houston Smith is, in my opinion, the most influential religious scholar of the 20th century. I feel very fortunate and indeed to have been able to speak with him at such length on a topic so dear to us both. Houston's books have sold millions of copies over the last six decades, many of which became required textbooks at leading universities. His TV shows and interviews have been seen, seen by millions more, yet few of his fans know that he is a self-proclaimed Vedantist, a Christian Vedantist. Let's get into his biography and see how Houston's views have evolved. Houston Smith was born in 1919 in rural China to missionary parents. 
His family was very well respected and lived their Christian religious beliefs, helping the poor and teaching by example. In all his explorations of the world's religions, Houston never had cause to give up his bedrock Christian roots. When I came to this country, why, well, uh, at first I thought I was going right back as a missionary. How old were you then? I was 17, and my only American male role model was my father. And so I grew up assuming that missionaries were what American boys grew up to be. But I was totally unprepared for the dynamism of the West. You know, never mind that it was Central Methodist College, enrollment 600, uh, in Fayette, Missouri, population 3,000. Uh, compared with Podunk, China, it was the big time and the bright light, and by two weeks, uh, China had faded into a happy memory. I wasn't going to squander my life in the backwaters of rural China. But I just moved over uh, across the street, so to speak, um, and I'd be a minister. Then something happened in my junior year, and I ended trying to get out of as many organizations as I could in order to focus on my studies. Why? I mean, what happened? Well, what happened was there was a little discussion group that the philosophy professor organized, you know, and once a month, why he would have us over and we would discuss a philosophical issue. I suppose it must have been mounting in me all evening as we walked back to our dormitory, a uh, little cluster of us, four or five, uh, stood in the dorm hall until after midnight, just hammer and tong, talking about these uh, as uh, <laughs> unlikely a group of peripatetics as you would find anywhere. But it kept on going as I went alone to my room until, I don't know when, maybe around one or two o'clock, uh, it's just like my mind detonated, uh, demolishing mental stockades. And it was almost like an mystical experience, uh, like ideas were almost visible, the platonic form were out there, you could almost touch it, and just uh, receding from me endlessly. I wonder if I slept at all that night, but that was a changing point, and after that, why, well, never mind the organization, to focus on this, and that has stayed in play. That has been, you know, the life, uh, life-giving lure. Sometime during his undergraduate studi studies, Houston became attracted to the religious philosophy of Henry Nelson Wyman, whose personal beliefs are described as theocentric naturalism. God is behind all existence, but only natural laws and forces operate in the universe as opposed to spiritual processes. After World War II, science and the scientific method were becoming a dominant force in our culture. Houston attended graduate school at the University of Chicago under the direction of noted religious thinker Henry Nelson Wyman, who was instrumental in shaping thinking about religious naturalism. He wrote, it's impossible to gain knowledge of the total cosmos or to have any understanding of the infinity transcending the cosmos. Consequently, beliefs about these matters are illusions, cherished for their utility in producing desired states of mind. During this time in Chicago, Houston met Wyman's daughter, Eleanor, now Kendra. They were married in 1943. Karen, the first of three daughters, was born in 1944 followed by Gail in 1947 and Kim in 1949. While doing research for his doctoral thesis, Houston was looking for books on the subject of pain and happened to run across Gerald Hurd's book, Pain, Sex, and Time. Being the most interesting title of the books in hand, 
Houston read, and read the whole night through. Heard opened Houston's mind to the idea of the transcendental. In the early 30s, he was the BBC science commentator. H.G. Wells once said that Heard was the only person he would listen to on the wireless. Houston found something so profound in Heard's writing that he made a vow not to read anything else by him until he finished his PhD. But once his union card was in hand, he would read everything by him. Gerald Heard is almost forgotten now, but in the 40s and 50s, he was a much sought after lecturer. He drew large crowds wherever he spoke, including here at the Hollywood Temple. Heard's mystic worldview took Houston away from the scientific naturalism into the world of the transcendental. I'll just add that since Houston had married Henry Nelson Wyman's daughter, there must have been a family conflict because Wyman did not believe in mystical states and the transcendental, but obviously Heard convinced Houston that uh, that's where things were at. In 1944, after getting his PhD, Houston accepted a teaching position in Denver at the University of Colorado. In 1947, Houston accepted a teaching position at Washington University in St. Louis. But before moving further east, Houston decided to get in touch with Gerald Hurd. Through Hurd's publisher, he got an address at Tribuco Canyon in Southern California. Gerald Hurd and Aldous Huxley had traveled from England before the war to Hollywood and studied under Swami Prabhavananda, the founder of the Vedanta Society of Southern California. They were soon joined by Christopher Isherwood. Gerald wanted to experiment with monastic living and raise funds to build Tribuco College. Huxley spent a good deal of time there as well, including a six-week stretch while working on the perennial philosophy. Later, Heard would donate the grounds and building to the Vedanta Society. Houston hitchhiked to Tribuco and hit it off with Heard, who asked him if he would care to meet Aldous Huxley. Houston was eager to do so. Before leaving Southern California, Houston met with Maria and Aldous Huxley at their desert retreat. Later, Houston would describe the simple pleasures of sweeping the floors with Maria and walking into the desert with Aldous, discussing the desert fathers and the nature of reality. It was suggested by Heard that once Houston settled in St. Louis, he should look up Swami Sat Prakashananda. Swami Sat Prakashananda was the go-to scholar for Pravananda and Nikilananda to check on the validity of translations. After Houston and his family arrived in St. Louis, he looked up the address and took a bus to the apartment, which then housed the, uh, the center. Houston recognized the format of Swami's Kata Upanishad's class. It was the same format as traditional Bible study class. A verse was read, and then the Swami would explain the meaning and substance of the passage. Houston was hooked. At first, Houston found it a little exotic a swami in orange robes and Hindu trappings. But on his way out, he buys a copy of the Upanishads and for the second time of his life, stayed up all night reading. What struck him was that so much truth was packed into so few words. At Washington University, the dean has decided that the school should broaden its outlook to include courses that would give students a perspective on the world. Since World War II, a broader worldview would perhaps help the cause of world peace. Since Houston is the new man in the philosophy department, he is given the assignment. This is the genesis of Houston's Religion of Man, later to be retitled The World's Religions. Much of the material for the chapter on Hinduism came from the 10-year association between Houston and Swami Satprakashananda. Houston had said of him that he had met scholars and he had met holy men but never before had he met both in the same person. He found himself once again on the verge of two traditions, Christianity and Hinduism, as he submitted to weekly tutorials with the renowned scholar Swami Satprakashananda. There was a moment in St. Louis, a few years, where uh, I had a dual role. I uh, was 
listed as associate minister at the Methodist Church nearby and was uh, president of the Vedanta Society of St. Louis which was uh, teaching me metaphysical profundities that uh, my church certainly was not preaching, that this all came to a head on Christmas Eve because uh, there would be a four o'clock Christmas service uh, at the church which would be a family affair in the afternoon so the children could come. And that was wonderful, Christmas music, Silent Night, all of that, all of the magic of Christmas and being together with our children was just glorious. But then we would go home, have a supper, uh, put the children to bed early for their early rising, for the, and then I would slip off to the Vedanta Society, where every Christmas Eve, Swami Saprakashananda, he never varied his title, was Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And even though in the Methodist Church there was all the happiness of the family togetherness, when it came to spiritual death, what he said, the Swami said, about the incarnation fed my soul more than any Christmas sermon in the Methodist Church. Now you see, I'm a living witness to the fact that I have drawn spiritual succor from an alien tradition which, however, was true to the metaphysical teachings of original Christianity more than my church, which had been diluted by modernism. What is not well known to even Houston's and Kendra's friends is that they were very involved in the St. Louis Civil Rights Movement of the 1950s. Not just supporters, but active in marches, demonstrations, and lunch counter sit-ins. Oh. Houston and Kendra were among the founding members of the St. Louis chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE which carried out sustained nonviolent campaigns from 1947 to 1957, which were among the earliest in the nation to end racial segregation in public accommodations. Kendra participated in lunch counter sit-ins, and Houston brought Martin Luther King to speak at the still segregated Washington University and worked within the administration to fully desegregate. Houston had tremendous contribution to the Vedanta Society of St. Louis. He was the president of our society. He brought his students from the Washington University to Swami Shat Prakashananda and introduced them with the Swami. Then in 1951, Swami Shat Prakashananda wanted to buy a house and there was a little racial prejudice in that area at that time. The owner of the house did not want to sell the house to Swami. So the present house was bought in Houston and his wife Kendra's name. Then Houston transferred that property to the Vedanta Society. In the early days of television, there was a frantic search for original content to broadcast in the mid-1950s. The local affiliate of National Education Television, NET, which was the precursor to PBS, found out that one of the most popular lecturers at the local universities was Houston Smith in his Religions of Man courses. A producer was assigned to help turn Houston's lectures into a nationally broadcast series which gave many Americans their first introduction to Eastern religions and Islam. We're going to talk 
tonight about the yoga. Now this is a very strange word to us. In fact, uh, uh, I find myself smiling in a Western context whenever I turn to this word because well, we associate it with the bizarre, the fantastic, the occult, maybe even the fraudulent a little bit, the fakers. Uh, this is where they come to, we come to the famous yoga position. And I want to just show you what this is. There's always a, uh, a little humor involved in this because it's so strange to us. But nevertheless, I think we ought to know what this is. They say the most effective position, which will still the mind, is the so-called yoga, the lotus posture. You, it doesn't go very well with shoes, which is why I've taken mine off. Actually, it doesn't go very well with trousers either, but we'll forget about that tonight. You put one foot up here in the lap, then all you have to do is to bring the other foot around like that. The spine must be completely straight. Now they say when you get used to this, the point is that this will put your mind at rest and keep out the bodily distractions better. With the growing national reputation that Houston earned with the publication of his book in the TV series, he was approached by other universities, including the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In 1958, Houston accepted a position at MIT and moved his family to Boston. In 1960, Houston is given a budget to bring a guest lecturer for a semester and calls on his friend Aldous Huxley. This creates a sensation. The lecture series is wildly successful, creating traffic problems throughout the Boston area and an overflow packed hall. Huxley suggests that Houston should contact Harvard professors Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert who are doing research on the effects of psychedelic drugs on human consciousness which might hold religious significance. The point that interests me is that whereas the ordinary, everyday experience is of course absolutely essential most of the time, it's not the only possible experience. There are also other types of consciousness, I mean the artist's type, the mystic's type, and so on, which uh, have uh, empirically an enormous value and may help people to live less self-centered and more charitable lives and more understanding lives. In 1962, Smith participated in what would later be called the Good Friday Experiments, meant to induce mystical experiences through religious settings while under the influence of LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin. At the time, these drugs were not only legal, but considered quite legitimate research subject. There have been many books written about those early psychedelic experiments. One recent book, The Harvard Psychedelic Club, portrays Houston as the adult in the room, who cautiously described the potential benefits of the drugs, as well as the pitfalls and abuses that may follow. These faces may be more familiar to you. When talking about psychedelics, the connection of, uh, to religious experiences, Houston cautions with a Chinese proverb, no 10 things, tell nine, feeling that it's nearly impossible to speak on the subject without being misunderstood. I think Houston would say that the drugs may be a useful signpost on the way, but the drug experience is not the destination nor the means to get there. He makes the point that it's not altered states we seek, but altered traits. That fits with what Swami Prabhavananda said about the difference between psychedelic drug experience and the true spiritual experience. The religious experience changes your character. The drugs do not. During one of many uh, round the world trips that Houston made while staying in a Tibetan monastery, he heard something remarkable and unique. In 1967, while traveling in Tibet, Houston makes what he calls the single most important empirical discovery of his career. While listening to the Tibetan monks chanting, he hears and recognizes that each monk is producing multiphonic chords from their voices. Houston records them, and then back at MIT has acoustic scientists confirm his findings. The music of Tibet is introduced to the West. 
The recording is still in print, now on CD, and the monks perform in concert through the generous efforts of Mickey Hart of the Grateful Dead and others. Because of Houston's popularity with TV audiences, he was asked to host another NET series consisting of interviews with leading authors and intellectuals under the title The Search for America. Later, a book of the same title was produced with excerpts from the interviews. During Houston's career, he interviewed some of the most well-known and influential religious and intellectual leaders in the U.S. and around the world, including D.T. Suzuki, Krishnamurti, Eleanor Roosevelt, John Kenneth Galbraith, Margaret Mead, Reinhold Niebuhr, and Paul Tillich, to name a few. He also helped bring his friend, the Dalai Lama, to the U.S. for the first time. In 1967, uh, Houston interviewed Krishnamurti. Uh, this clip shows Houston in action. While Krishnamurti was adamant about rejecting all authority, especially spiritual teachers, Houston believed that spiritual teachers could greatly help. The clip also captures how Houston deals with ideas that he feels are absurd. Rather than arguing and saying that's ridiculous, he gently and characteristically says, I wonder, and then continues the conversation. No dualism, you say, no separation. And in your view, is this the case that there is no separation? Absolutely there is. Here, do you feel any separation? Is there any separation, you, me? Absolutely. Physically there is. Yeah. You have got a black suit, you have a fairer person than me. But you don't so feel. I, if I felt uh, dualistic, I wouldn't even sit down to discuss it. Because I, then you would be intellectually, uh, we play with each other. Right. Now, perhaps we're saying the same thing, but it always it comes out in my mind as a both and. We are both separate and we are united. Know. So, both. when you love both. somebody with your heart, not with your mind, do you feel separate? I do in some, it's both. I feel I'm both separate and together. Then it's not love. I wonder, because love, uh, part so of the joy of love is the relationship which involves in some sense like Ramakrishna said, I uh, want to be sugar. I don't I know. Sugar. I don't know Ramakrishna. I don't want to marry authority. I don't want to quote any bird. Don't get hung up on No, I am, I am, sir, sir, no. I am, I am dealing, I am, we are dealing with facts, not what somebody said. I'll just add that Houston would play the full one-hour interview for his students to gauge their attitudes uh, about Krishnamurti's teachings. After roughly a decade each at Washington University in St. Louis and MIT in Boston, Houston moved to Syracuse University in New York State. In 1973, Houston accepted a position at Syracuse University. While there, he came to realize that he had left out Native American religions from his great book. In my uh, formal education of religion, I say that with a wry smile, uh, was taught that they were primitive with the pejorative uh, built solidly into that word. And therefore, the, no reason to pay any attention to them except for uh, historical reason. What the old people felt way back in the childhood of the human race. I would have gone out my life in that mode if I hadn't moved to Syracuse, where providentially I was moving into the shade of the Onondaga Reservation, and that 10 years that I was there absolutely transformed my view of the indigenous religion, and I am so grateful I will not go to my grave not having entered a final chapter in the second edition of my book. Houston also became involved with the case to legalize peyote for Native American religious ritual. A decade-long struggle finally succeeded in recognizing the right to practice the religious traditions of the Native Americans. 
Bill Moyers is a journalist who has done in-depth reporting on current events ranging from politics to religion. In 1988, PBS aired a six-part series on Joseph Campbell titled The Power of Myth. The series was watched by millions. Then in 1996, Moyers and PBS produced a five-part series on the world's religions titled The Wisdom of Faith with Houston Smith. What do you make of that Hindu proverb, there are realms of gold hidden in the depths of our hearts? In the Upanishads, the philosophical versions and texts of Hinduism, there is a phrase that comes repeatedly like the clang of a gong. It's tat twam asi. Literally, that thou art. And what it means is the that which we seek in Brahman, the divine, whatever you call it, is right here within you. You see, they not only they begin by saying you can have what the, what you want, and that sounds very good. But wait till you get to the climax, and that is you've already got it. Houston's personal religious practices evolved over time. Starting with Sat Prakashananda, he added meditation to his regular Christian practice of reading scripture, singing hymns, and prayer. Houston would retain some of the practices from various religions he studied. He said standing on his head was his favorite yoga posture as it raised his metabolism the most. Also for a time, he did the Islamic prayers five times a day. He was a strong and vocal advocate of the perennial philosophy seeing it as the only plausible explanation that the same core religious truths arose independently from all the major cultures throughout history. Swami Chaitanananda tells of being with Houston at a book signing in Kansas City. A young man asked Houston, you're a Christian, why are you involved with other religions? Houston replied with a smile, young man, hold on to your faith. As you eat regular food and take vitamins as food supplements, similarly, I enjoy my own religion and take other religions as supplements. They all give me tremendous strength and extra energy. Houston liked to compare what Christ taught to the four yogas of Vedanta. Love the Lord with all thy heart, that is bhakti yoga, with all thy soul, that is raja yoga, with all thy mind, which is jnana yoga, with all thy strength, which is karma yoga. Also, Houston compared the great Vedic dictum, I am Brahman, to Christ saying, I and the Father are one. After retiring from full-time teaching, Houston didn't drop out of sight. He kept writing and lecturing, and at one point in his 80s, he had to promise Kendra to slow down and do no more than one local talk per week, no more than two out-of-towners per month, and no more than two international talks per year. When we see Houston in the Bill Moyers interviews, we see him at his apex. He was in his mid-70s. Now we meet Houston in his 90s. He suffered progressive hearing loss, osteoporosis, macular degeneration, and slowing memory and organizational skills. In his mid-80s, he opted to get a cochlear implant operation, and he compensated for his memory loss by setting up a successful system of notes and papers to keep himself communicating and working. He said that correspondence that came in went in a pile and he dealt with them in order. Nobody jumped the line. Houston gave hundreds of interviews in his later years. I believe that the fundamental faith of all the authentic religions is it all makes sense. There is an analogy used frequently that between, well, we're asked to visualize a wonderful tapestry hanging wall, ceiling to floor in uh, a museum. Our problem, the human problem is we are looking at the tapestry from the wrong side. And you know what that's like. I mean, uh, bits and snippets of yarn and so on cut off. 
It makes no sense at all. And then the point of religion is to take us by the hand and lead us from looking at the backside to the front where it's a great work of art. For one of his last interviews, noted lecturer and gerontologist, Dr. Ken Dykewald, and, oh, sorry, Dr. Ken Dykewald sought Houston's views on the subject of aging. The idea was that Houston was a pioneer for many of us as a seeker of spiritual truth. Now in his 90s, he could be a pioneer for us again, reporting on the road up ahead as we age. As Houston said, he came loaded for bear. He was ready even before the cameras finished being set up and started right in on his views of aging throughout human history, not even waiting for a question. Everywhere that human beings have lived, uh, whenever they have lived, always they've been faced with uh, three inescapable problems. One, how to earn their livelihood from the soil. Second, how to get along with their fellow human being. And third, uh, how to get along with themselves. Uh, now it so happens that the great enduring civilizations are also three in number. Uh, East Asia, China for short, South Asia, India for short, and the West. Now, my thesis is uh, that in their great historical uh, developments, these three civilizations have uh, poured more of their attention uh, into one of these problems, but differently. Throughout Houston's career, he maintained his connection with Vedanta, occasionally going back to the St. Louis Center and lecturing. After retiring to Berkeley, he made a point to attend the annual Memorial Day retreat in Olima, just north of San Francisco hosted by the Vedanta Society of Northern California, where speakers from the world's religions are invited to talk. In the last stage of his life, Houston wrote two books of reminiscences and saw his official biography published, written by Dana Sawyer. But eventually, Houston's health gave out as he approached his late 90s. Told that he only had a few months to live, he was enrolled in home hospice care. He reported that he was in no pain and was comfortable. Slowly, Houston's, sense, Houston's senses fell from him. He was already profoundly deaf, even before hospice. Then his eyesight fade, faded, and at times seemed to lose all contact with the outside world. Houston's North Campus home in Berkeley was nice, but humble. For years, Houston and Kendra sponsored a multi-generational Tibetan refugee family. They lived in a detached, converted garage apartment. This family proved to be a great blessing for Houston and Kendra as Houston's health declined. As Houston's physical condition weakened, the Tibetan family moved into the main house to care for him. At that point, there were three generations in the family, including a toddler and two rescue dogs. The family slept upstairs in what used to be Houston's bedroom and office. Houston slept in the downstairs bedroom, confining himself to the ground level, and Kendra slept in the garage apartment. He was not ready to give up, which made his extended hospice period so intriguing. When people came to visit, Houston knew who they were and would rise to the occasion. When we visited, he spoke about Swami Satprakashananda and how much Swami had meant to him. Similarly, when Swami Chaitanya visited, he again talked about Satprakashananda. He was in hospice, at times at death's door, for a total of two years and eight months. We can only guess at what was going on inside. On December 30th, 2016, Houston dropped the body. 
a phrase he picked up from Vedanta, which he liked to use when referring to bodily death. Sorry. His memorial was held at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco on April 1st, 2017. everyone who has gathered to honor the uh, ever alive spirit of Houston Smith. So many of us here today found someone we were looking for when we found Houston. Our lives it seems had somehow disclosed to us the reality of the sacred and we wanted to know more. Because we sought knowledge, we were looking for scholars. With a doctorate in philosophy from Chicago at age 25, Houston qualified. Because we were students, we were looking for teachers, and Houston was a gifted one, made sharper still by his early embrace of the rigors of television. Because we were readers, we were looking for writers, and Houston loved to write. He sometimes said his favorite way to pray was with a pencil in his hand. Eventually, there were 14 books and over 100 articles. Because some of us had encountered entheogens, we were delighted to find someone who was soberly sympathetic. In 1964, Houston published Do Drugs Have Religious Import? The most anthologized piece ever to appear in that journal's history, reprinted in 14 books. Because we had been born into a globalizing world, we were looking for a universalist who found it unthinkable that the infinite could privilege any particular culture or institution. Long before I was a perennialist, Houston once said, I was a universalist. And because we were hungry for authenticity, we were looking for someone who laid himself open to traditional methods of attunement to the ground of being, as Houston did. All this would have been quite enough, but the wonder that was Houston also came wrapped, as George Hart once put it, in an incomparable combination of personal warmth, infectious humor, exceptional clarity, and unobtrusive but palpable spirituality. It is no wonder then that when we did find Houston, whenever and wherever we found him, we leaned toward him like plants toward sunlight. As the recognized Dean of World Religion Studies, Houston was often invited to be the keynote speaker at interfaith gatherings, as was the case of this event held in San Francisco featuring Houston's old friend, the Dalai Lama. He supported such efforts and felt there were two important principles that had to be upheld and when required, defended. The first was that all the traditional religions are true and all lead to union with our divine nature. This is expressed in the Vedantic saying, truth is one, sages call it by various names. Or from Chaitanya's prayer, various are their names, O Lord, in each and every name thy power resides. Houston also insisted that one should choose a path and then stick with it. He argued against what he called cafeteria religion, taking a bit of this and a bit of that, but avoiding what you think is unpleasant. As Ramakrishna said in the Gospel, you must stick with one path with all your strength. A man can reach the roof of a house by stone stairs, a ladder, or a rope, or even a bamboo pole, but he cannot reach the roof if he sets foot on one now 
and another one later. He should firmly follow one path. I'll let Houston have the final word. My other and final comment is someone once asked Mahatma Gandhi, wouldn't it be wonderful if goodness were as contagious as the common cold? <laughs> <laughs> and he answered, when will we ever learn that goodness is as contagious as the common cold? <laughs> so I'm going to leave this day a better person, the goodness of His Holiness and all of us who are joined together in the noble task because I've caught the contagious <laughs> from you and from all of you. Because Houston was profoundly deaf, he couldn't hear the thunderous standing ovation he was receiving. Like Beethoven, he had to be turned to face the audience.